everybody, I'm Tall. And I'm Small. And today we're going to be going over Khan Academy's MCAT prep biomolecules question first set amino acids and proteins. Dang, I did that good. <laughs> All right, so we're going to just jump right into it. Very first question. Which of the following amino acids has a net negative charge at physiologic pH 7.4? Uh, is it glutamic acid, histidine, asparagine, or lysine? Don't ever help crazy yodelers kick rams. I'm slowly learning what that means, but please explain it again. <laughs> okay, so it's one of my mnemonics for remembering all of the important charged amino acids, the, mm. the polar ones that we have. Um, and it orders them from um, PKs from you know starting with the acids that are low around 3.4 and all the way up to um things at the very end so kick rams arginine which would be up around 12. Yes. i have to say it in my head to get through it and i will probably have to say it on the mcat as well argar <laughs> yes um and so it asks for a net negative charge and if you have taken biochem you kind of intrinsically know that those will be your amino acids i'm sorry not your amino acids um your carboxylic acids yes your carboxylic acids mm -hmm. and then things that are more basic are actually positive and that would be things like lysine uh, and histidine that can carry a positive charge but doesn't histidine isn't there something special about it is doesn't it is something at physiologic at physiologic ph yes um it can be what is it don't ever help crazy you yes I, I think it's pk is around six and so uh. physiological ph is close enough to that where it can be and sometimes is not it's um, like if the local environment gets changed a little bit it can be right oh, like in the... trips and active site that's it yep so we see it involved in a lot of cool active site chemistry because it can help us deprotonate certain substrates um and then give those uh, protons to other things and and be stable in that deprotonated state as well. It's really cool. Anyway, so the one here that would probably be negatively charged at uh, a, a physiologic pH of 7.4 um, would be one that has a really low pKa and so in order to be protonated and therefore not charged it would have to be um, below that number but so so knowing the answers they gave us, glutamic acid was one of our carboxylic acids uh, has a pK of around 3.1, 4.1, mm -hmm. um, and so it would have to be the pH would have to be below that for that to be protonated and therefore not charged. So it's going to be negative from there all the way up, including physiologic pH. Yep, and you can kind of reason that out. If I know histidine, lysine, and asparagine are all uh, pretty much over the pH they gave me, I can rule those out pretty quick. Yeah, absolutely. All right, and we were right. Next question. Okay. A polypeptide with a net positive charge at physiologic pH, once again, 7.4, most likely contains amino acids with R groups of what type? Okay, so they're talking about a net positive charge, physiologic pH, what R groups do they probably have? Are they aromatic R groups, basic R groups, allopathic R groups, or acidic R groups? What do you immediately think when you think basic? I think high pH. High pH, okay, or a high pKa? Yeah, could be high pK. Okay, so it'd have to be uh, below that to be protonated. So acidic R groups doesn't really make any sense to me. Uh, if you're talking about an acidic R group, then you're expecting it to have given away its proton already at a really low pH. Uh, aromatic R groups, that encompasses such a broad range of things, and they, they're not ever like involved in uh, pH chemistry. Um, I don't even know what allopathic means. And basic R groups makes a lot of sense to me. It does. And I remember my, my basic R groups are the ones to the far right of don't ever help crazy yodelers kick rams. Kick rams. Um, and so lysine, arginine, uh, and, and histidine can also mm. be up there as well. All right. Basic R groups. And sure enough, that was it. Strong work. Okay. Next question. The amino acids in hemoglobin, or any protein, uniformly have which of the following configurations? D, ah. L, S, or R? Yes. I know it's not S and R. Good. Um, D and L. Okay. Uh, so you can remember this by our carbs are normally one. You can remember this by our carbs are normally one. And the other configuration um, would be for our amino acids. And so do you remember what, we, what form of glucose we normally have in the body? D. Yes. So then our other one would naturally be... L. Perfect. Oh, L. L is the right answer. 
Ah. You sound surprised. <laughs> <laughs> I was kind of lost in uh, lost in all of the letters there. Okay, next question. Which of the following properties of a protein is least likely to be affected by changes in pH? Mm. Tertiary structure, primary structure, net charge, secondary structure. People, do not fall for this on the MCAT. They're trying to give you all these things. Primary structure is so hard to... They, there's so many questions where they're going to be giving you all these really cool things that could possibly disrupt, disrupt one of the structures. Don't fall for it. Almost nothing is ever going to be disrupting primary structure on the MCAT unless they're talking about an enzyme. I just had to throw that out there because these questions always piss me off. <laughs> so, so something like a protease. Right. Okay. That would cleave the peptide bonds. Uh, you know, tertiary structure, that's, I think, held together by hydrogen bonding, right? That's one part of it. There's a whole bunch of them, right? So when we talk about tertiary structure, it's all of our hydrophobic interactions, um, you know, disulfide bonds help us mm. maintain configuration, van der Waals forces, um, and I know I'm missing one, I can't think of it right well, now. Well, all of which things that could possibly be also affected by the pH of the environment. Oh, yeah. As well as secondary structure, which that's the one that's held together by hydrogen bonding. In the... Alpha helix. A or... Air beta sheet. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so uh, the answer here is primary structure. Sure enough, that was it. I'm pretty sure net charge would only be affected by things like that. Yeah, exactly. Okay. <laughs> okay, uh, next question. So hydrogen bonding between, a sep between separate subunits of DNA polymerase is an example of which of the following? Okay, hydrogen bonding between separate subunits, primary structure, secondary, tertiary, or quaternary. Okay, they said separate subunits. Mm -hmm. That was kind of a, a kind of a gimme. If you have multiple uh, proteins getting together and they are not from the same, you know, amino acid chain. If they're forming a complex, mm -hmm. which which people kind of get thrown off when they mention a big enzyme, but just think of like hemoglobin, four subunits. Right. So you're always talking about quaternary structure once you get past just one poly polypeptide chain, and we got it. Perfect. All right, next question. The unique cyclic structure of which of the following amino acids plays a central role in the formation of alpha helices and beta sheets? Okay, cyclic structure. So we're talking about valine, lysine, proline, or arginine. There's no choice here. Yeah, no, they kind of gave it away. It's got to be proline, people. Remember that structure? Yep, think collagen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pro proline, glycine, uh, and then any amino acid, right? Yep. For that turn. Okay, next question. Electrophoretic separation of leucine from a protein sample would be least effective at which of the following pH values? So that's gel electrophoresis, right? Like mm -hmm. we, we tend to know. Yeah. Okay, so is it 1.4, 7.4, 2.4, or 0 0.4? So I think a helpful little MCAT trick to use here is that they gave you three very acidic pHs and then one at physiologic pH. Yeah. So um, I would assume that that's the answer, just answering like an MCAT question. Right, and and I would do the same because it's not one of the ones where you should memorize the PKA, so there's nothing really special about it. It's one of our hydrophobic. I don't think that um, you'd be able to separate it based on a PKA. Right, so I would go with 7.4 physiologic pH. Exactly. And we got it. All right, next question. Uh, once again, electrophoretic separation at pH of six of a poly of a sample of polypeptide one uh, molecular weight 100 polypeptide two molecular weight 200 and polypeptide three molecular weight 400 will result in what which of the following which of the following geez this thing was worded weird i could not read that right so <laughs> they're saying you know if our gel is at a ph6 um and the isoelectric points to the point where there's no net charge on each of these polypeptide chains um, Ooh, they did note that the isoelectric six, point of each polypeptide is at six. Which means that they are only giving us uh, an ability to separate these proteins on charge. On um, mass? Mass. Yes, that's Goodness, why they gave us the three, size. the three different sizes. Right. So we have polypeptide two would move the farthest. None of the peptides would move. Polypeptide three would move the farthest. Or polypeptide one would move the farthest. So looking at this like an MCAT question, we knew it would have to be either the smallest or the largest. Mm -hmm. So I run these all the time. So I want to hear what you would have picked. So I would have picked none of them would move. Because if we're doing electrophoretic separation and they're all at their PI, right? Because if their isoelectric point was at pH of six, 
then all we have to go off of is mass. I think that was a misdirection. I think gel electrophoresis is just the the term for for adding a protein or DNA and moving it from the negative side of the plate to the positive. Um, or that's what I would have thought while I was taking this, if this was the real test. Mm -hmm. um, and so going off that, like maybe this is a regular SDS gel. And so, you know, all of them don't, we're just working with size separation here. Um, and so I would say that the smallest one would move the farthest and the, the larger ones would stay farther up because it would be caught by those pores. Mm -hmm. So I would have said B. Okay, well, let's both click it at the same time. Oh, no. Oh, yes! <laughs> oh, no, I'm the wet lab person, and I got this wrong. I spend all my day in a computer closet. <laughs> okay, so um, let's look at their hint, though, because we were, we were at odds on that one. Okay, so the isoelectric point for a polypeptide is the pH at which the molecule does not have a net charge. Okay. Okay, we knew that. Um, electrophoretic separation depends <laughs> on the existence of a net, <laughs> of uh, a negative net charge. We even said that. <laughs> electrophoretic separation depends on the existence of a net, of a negative net charge. Okay. So if not, yeah, if they're all at their PI, none of them would move. Ooh, those, that molecular weight was a, was a bit of a... It was. I took the bait. Yeah. And then I said all of the things that I should have used to get to the right answer. So this is how this is going. This is a thing that I like to say about the MCAT people is that when you go back to your childhood, as we all did, and remember what Squidward told SpongeBob oh God. when he opened up a fancy five-star restaurant, clear your mind of everything but fine dining and breathing, except, hey, hang on, let me switch this up for you for a second. Clear your mind of everything that you've ever learned that isn't in Khan or Kaplan or uh, exam crackers or insert your favorite content review there. That's a good point. Don't overthink the question. Sometimes they'll give you the answer in the passage. We're too smart for our own goods, people. All right, next question. The alpha helix is an example of uh, which of the following structural properties of proteins? Tertiary, secondary, quaternary, primary. If you miss this, you're in trouble. Okay, well, it's definitely not primary. Primary is the actual peptide chain. Um, secondary, I wish they were in order like this because I know that's the answer. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so that is the answer. But quickly, let's go to uh, tertiary structure is once you have all of your beta sheets, your beta barrels, your uh, alpha helices, all of your loops that are going to stay soluble. Once you have all those things formed, it's then going to be... Uh, uh, folded up based on hydrophobic interactions or disulfide bonds, also chaperone proteins. I don't really remember how that whole system works, but that helps to create the tertiary structure, right? Yeah, chaperones help us fold. And I do want to correct one thing. Mm. Um, and you are the protein expert. And yeah, why you always got to go for the transmembrane protein? Somebody's biased. I don't know. Um, but the disulfide bonds don't help us fold at all. That's something uh, that I'm learning new in oh. cell bio. They're just a stabilizing force. Um, okay. But yeah, the chaperonins, uh, oh, I'm sorry, chaperones, the chaperonins as well, are proteins that just help us get to that final tertiary structure. Mm -hmm. Chaperonins are a cool version of them that are like a mini little house, and they bring proteins inside and let them fold up and do what they're going to do, and then they release them to the wild. That's too cool. It is. I'd never even heard of them before. Yeah, I hadn't either. Um, and then we know uh, quaternary structure, uh, that's, you know, that's like multiple proteins combining together. It's way too big for an alpha helix uh we're going with secondary structure and we got it all right next question all right last question all hydrophobic amino acids valine leucine isoleucine etc share which of the following properties <laughs> polar uncharged r groups basic r groups non-polar uncharged r groups acidic r groups Wow. I don't think you would ever get one this simple. I think this is throwing us a bone. <laughs> it might be throwing us a bit of a bone. Uh, I think we can both uh, confirm it is non-polar uncharged R groups. I'm so disappointed. And boom, we got it. It's okay. We all can't be as brilliant as the tall one. 